Uh, yes, there's one here at the front. Hello. Um, that was brilliant. That was brilliant. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just curious about your research. I was guessing as people's memories go and recollections fade. Are you almost completely wrong with the work of the Because people's memories are fading and it is a long time ago, am I relying mostly on paperwork these days? I think that was your question. Yes, is the answer. In-person interviews have become almost redundant now. If you were young then, if you were 16 in 1962, you're now 76. And um, it's just really not worth, you get the odd gem, but it's really not particularly worth the bother. The prime time for interviewing is now past because the events are too, are too long ago. Pieces of paper are really what it's all about. And what you saw there literally is the content of my filing cabinet or my virtual filing cabinet on my computer. <clears throat> and they tell a much better story. I don't know that any person or even groups of people could have told me that. And what that is, in essence, is the piecing together of an archive, because you can find this piece here and that piece there, and this piece here and that piece down there. It's only when you plug them together that you actually see what the story is. And I spent all my years looking for the story, and that means looking for the little pieces but what a glorious story they tell. And you know, the, the fact that documents will tell you things that no human being even remembers, you know, like Brian registering the name, or the fact that the first agreement was McCartney, Lennon, not Lennon McCartney, all things like that would only, can only come from pieces of paper. So uh, yeah, I have a great, great time because I spend <clears throat> my life looking for pieces, and, uh, and everyone is a joy. And finding them and knowing how to use them is, is you know, what I do, basically, yeah. Um, there's one right in the middle there before we come down here. Hello. It's a brilliant show, Mark. Uh, I just want to Thank jump forward to 69, if I may. And <laughs> yes. Can what your takeaway was from Get Back? My takeaway from Get Back? Um, oh, so many, so many. Um, eye contact. The way they looked at each other in the eye, particularly John and Paul, I had never had quite the understanding of Lennon McCartney's relationship until then. And all the books had told us, including some I wrote, you know, when, when I knew less, that you know that they were falling out badly and all of that. But just look at the two of them in Get Back. They are strong as like twin brothers. They are incredibly close, and their eye contact with one another is almost unbroken. And the others just have to accept that. They are the absolute centre of this group, although everybody makes their contribution. So that was something. Um, their ability to get themselves out of difficulties, their maturity with which they spoke with one another. You know, they actually, they could work out their own problems quite well. Ultimately, their, a problem arose over business which they couldn't get over, and that's what broke them. But look at them as people. They could actually work things out for themselves in a way that is quite unusual for anybody ever, but for young men in the 1960s, you know, I think that they were probably unique in that respect. And what you see in Get Back is 1969. If we had cameras there doing the same thing in 68 or 67 or 66 or 5 or 4 or 3, you would see, I'm convinced, the same thing. And it wouldn't be Get Back there recording. It would be Revolver or Rubber Soul or With the Beatles or A Hard Day's Night. All these projects, they're clearly... They've got that relationship, and that's what sees them all the way through. They're so strong. That's that's my two of my takeaways from Get Back. I could talk about it for hours. Mm. Um, there was somebody else down the front here. Thank you very much for the invite. You are brilliant. Uh, thank you, Gary. Can I say? Yeah. This is Mal Evans' son, Gary, sitting on the front row here. Oh, it's, Ju it's Julie. Sorry, I couldn't see. Yes, it's Julie, Mal's daughter. Mal Sutter, thank you for coming. I didn't know you were coming. I'm very glad you came. Yeah, I'm glad I mentioned Mal. Yeah, thank you for saying he was the hero. Well, yeah. I mean, yes, that's another great takeaway. It's just the people around the Beatles are so interesting as well. In particular, in Get Back, you've got Kevin Harrington and his hero, Mal Evans, who uh, you don't see much of Neil Aspinall in that film, unfortunately, because he's mostly in the office, but Mal, yeah, absolute rock for the Beatles, yeah. Privilege several months back to me. Yes. One of the greatest moments in my life. Huh. Such a cool guy. 
Okay, Gary is saying that he had the privilege of meeting Kevin Harrington recently for the first time and enjoyed that very much. A great moment for him. Um, My question is... Oh, okay. <laughs> When did the first forged autographs occur? I think it would have been probably on their autumn tour in 1963. The Beatles used to arrive at these theatres, these old cinemas and theatres in towns and cities all over Britain, and there would be a mountain of autographs, autograph books waiting for them to sign, because girls and boys would hand them in at the dressing room at the stage door, to the bloke on the stage door, some grumpy old git probably, uh, and they'd all end up in the Beatles dressing room and they'd, have, they'd arrive and they'd be tired and hungry and the press would be after them and there's mania outside and they've got all these autograph books and, and so it all hands to the pump and everybody learned how to do the Beatles autographs. But they did sign plenty of their own, of course. But Mal did loads and Neil did loads and Tony Bramwell did loads and I think Frida could do a set as well. And I was once, this is name dropping, but I was once with George Harrison and watched him do a set of the Beatles autographs. And he did them well as well. Um, there are people who collect Beatles autographs by all four Beatles. You can get a set done by George, a whole set by George. So they just, they didn't want to disappoint people. And if a kid at the end of the night would go back to the stage door and collect his or her autograph book with autographs in, well, that was better than sending them away disappointed. And if 40 years later they went to Sotheby's and were told they weren't quite as genuine as they had hoped, that was just unfortunate. But they had enjoyed them all those years. Mal's mother, my grandmother, sold a set of autographs they forged. Right. Okay. Mal's mother sold a set of forged autographs, probably. I'm sure she didn't know. Right. Yes. Um, yes, David. Oh, I'll come back to you, David. Oh, many. I can't think offhand. Um, it was only when I was writing Tune In that I went to Hamburg for the first time. And when I stood there on the, on the Grosse Freiheit, why on earth have I not been here before? And maybe there are many here who haven't been, but Hamburg's Beagle locations are mostly intact uh, 60 years on. Um, there's a lot that's gone, of course, uh, in, in London, where places where the Beatles played are uh, you know, now destroyed. But there are still many. And um, there is a plan for a new edition of The Beatles in London, um, which has been out in two editions so far, not been out for 14 years. It's badly in need of an update. Uh, which is going to have about 700 London locations that have Beatles connections in there. So, yes. But I can't think offhand of one that has been destroyed that I'd like to have gone to, but I have been to a lot. Yeah. Um, further, fourth row, yes. Worth looking at some of the extra bits on the screen I read. There were two things that struck me. One which is not great, but was that um, Malcolm Cecil on Tonto's expanding headband. Yeah. Was the bass player in the establishment. Oh, I didn't notice that. I'm pretty sure it's the same. Malcolm Cecil in Tonto's expanding headband. That's Stevie, he, he was with uh, Stevie Wonder doing the synth on all those great albums in the 70s, right? He was in the establishment club that night, so Paul might have, well, would have seen him. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing was, I can't remember which one, but the top right of that first set of singles, yeah. the composer was Alan Klein. Yeah. Alan Klein, who wrote Robert, What a Crazy World We're Living In. That's Alan Klein, the Londoner, yeah. not Alan Klein, the New York businessman. Alan, A L A N Klein, uh, whose brother, Eddie, worked uh, for Paul McCartney until only a few about a year ago when he died. So Alan Klein, yeah, he was a kind of, I think he was involved in What a Crazy World We're Living In, the film as well, which was a well worth, well worth seeing. Came out in 62 and I didn't mention it. Fourth row. It's Lennon McCartney on Love Me Do. It's McCartney Lennon on Please Please Me and I think From Me To You and then She Loves You goes back to Lennon McCartney. And the records that other people released of Lennon McCartney songs were jumping both ways. Early Billy J. Kramer record jumped both ways. I think the foremost record, that they had two records both ways. It was only around August or September 63 that it settled as Lennon McCartney. But if you look in Paul's lyrics book that came out last Christmas, they're McCartney Lennon again. <laughs> Which is interesting. 
Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, please. Uh, I've got two questions as well, it's really quick. Um, yes. In your research for this uh, show, were there stuff that you found out that you would look back and think you'd like to go and sort of tune in? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do I need to repeat that? Could everybody yes. hear it? No, I couldn't, yes. Um, in, in my research for this, say, did I find things that I would like to put into tune in? And not so much for this specifically, this is pretty much those 500 pages of the book. But I certainly have, since tune in came out, discovered all sorts of nice new things that I didn't know. One that leaps to mind, now there are many of them, but one that leaps to mind is that um, when I wrote Tune In, I discovered that Stuart Sutcliffe had been on Granada television in a program with Spike Milligan in 1956, which was interesting, and I've got still photographs of that. Um, the next people on television, it turns out, was Ringo. When he was in Hamburg, that trip that ended in the flood, and he came home, he was on Hamburg television. And I only discovered that about a year ago, and I'd love to have put that in, um, and I didn't know it. I didn't mention it here either because it was just to get too fiddly. What was the second question? Just a quick one. Is there any chance this show might come up north? I did a tour in 2019 about the 50th anniversary of the Abbey Road album and what it did was bite a very big chunk out of that year for me. Uh, I enjoyed the experience but you really spend a lot of time in a van and eating petrol station sandwiches and hanging around and hotels and I wasn't at my desk and I need to be at my desk because I do have a book to write and I, I'm not unaware of that. So um, I decided on this trip at this time not to tour it. Um, it will be filmed and I'm hoping that I can sell it to Netflix or one of those, um, but, but we'll find out in the fullness of time. But if I only do the three shows next month, <clears throat> then I probably won't make as much on this as I needed to, but if I tour, it's kind of self-defeating. Um, because it takes too much time. I make more money, but it takes too much time. And talking of money, and I thank you for bringing this up, um, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed your afternoon. The tickets were free, and I'm very happy to give them away. It's a preview, a tryout, and I can see some things I need to improve and so on. But it has cost me a lot of money to put it on today, the hire of the theatre, the staff and all that. If anybody here, with no pressure whatsoever, should feel like they would like to donate something just so that I don't begin my shows next month with a big number in red on the balance sheet. If anybody feels like it, then that is my PayPal address, <laughs> at M. Lewison. But don't feel obliged and give whatever so you want to give. So oh, there you go, at Mark Lewison. But like I said, no pressure. This is not for the money, but just, you know, otherwise I'm going to be looking the first show next month will be just to wipe out the debt of this one. So, yeah, anyway. I'm embarrassed now, so I'll take that off the screen. Uh, anybody else? Yes, Jen, are, we, uh, are we doing this again this time next year for Evolver 63? Evolver 63? Well, there's a thought. I hadn't thought of that. Um, it's a possibility. I don't know. I mean, one of the things about this book is that everything is published and in that book. Uh, and if I do 63, well, I'm putting them ahead of the book because it won't be out by then. So I might do a show that's a little bit different. I might, this show originally in its conception was 62 single items, just objects, like that Radio 4 series, World in 500 Objects, 62 single items. What I found was I needed to tell the story of that item and that had to be done by putting them into episodes. Possibly for 63, I would just stick to that premise of 63 things. That might work. And I may do it late, earlier in the year, because I'm quite late to be doing an anniversary show. Um, in 60, for 62, it's already October, so maybe earlier. Or maybe I'll just have my head down in the book so much that I won't do it. I'm not quite sure yet. Yes, gentlemen there. How are you getting on with the tune in part two? How am I, <laughs> how am I getting on with tune in part two? Uh, well, but what. A beast of a project it is. I keep saying this, but when I worked on the Beatles anthology for the Beatles for Apple, we were, I was one of a big team of people who, um, who everybody had their skills and their talents and brought them into the creation of a single piece of work. I'm doing something very similar to that and I'm doing it all on my own. 
So there's so many jobs that one has to do which aren't even about writing on a piece of paper. They're about the admin of the project, they're about keeping on top of filing and all that kind of thing. I'm making very good headway with it. I've been researching it for years, but it's a big job and I honestly don't know when it's coming out and I wouldn't recommend you to hold your breath. We're all ready to read it when it's done. Thank you, I appreciate that. You're ready to read it. Thank you very much. Yes, at the back there. Hello, it's uh, another fascinating afternoon. Thank you again. You're very and, welcome. And um, I just wanted to ask, I was very surprised to see how in some of the very early photographs, yeah. George is already in possession of a Gretsch guitar. Yes. Which for a working class environment <coughs> yes. would have represented a hell of a commitment. Yes. Has there ever been any comment about whether the family had to make any sacrifices? Yeah, no. Uh, George Harrison got his... He first saw a Gretsch guitar in The Girl Can't Help It, the brilliant 1957 rock and roll film. The only really good rock and roll film of that era. Eddie Cochran was playing it and George drooled for this beautiful Gretsch and uh, eventually got one in the summer of 1961 when, believe it or not, it was advertised second-hand in the Liverpool Echo newspaper and he happened to see the ad. It was a, a, a merchant seaman, Liverpool-based, who had been to Manny's Music Shop in New York City, famous music store, got this Gretsch, come back, wasn't playing it often enough and decided to sell it. And George, George got it, I think, for 70 pounds, and I think he only had like 50. I, the figures are in the book because I found the man who sold it to George, who, who told me that George never turned up with the rest of it. <laughs> and he, George died owing him 20 quid still. Um, but I think, it, so therefore he paid about 50 pounds for it, and it was this beautiful, beautiful guitar, yeah. Well, Rickenbacker weren't on sale in the UK at the time, so where did John get his from? John got his American guitar in Hamburg. Britain had an export ban on instruments from America, an import ban, I should say, until 1959. So American instruments were virtually unknown in the UK, but John got that one in Hamburg and when the Beatles first went there. Yeah. Over on the side there. Well, apologies, I had to pop in, so this question has been asked already. I hope it hasn't. You have a letter from George Martin explaining about the best. Yes. Yes. And it was addressed to dear service. I was wondering if you knew who the letter was to and what the context of it was. That is a letter I showed on screen from George Martin in 1965, very observant to notice that it says dear sirs. Um, and uh, I blotted out the addressee on it because I just felt that I should. Um, but it was actually sent to a firm of solicitors who were representing Brian Epstein in the defence of Pete Best's case against him that he started in 1962. It didn't get settled until 1968. Um, and eventually there was a payment made to Pete Best uh, in 1968, not of a lot of money because he wasn't due a lot of money. It wasn't a proportion of the Beatles' fortune that he was due. What he was due was loss of employment at the point when Brian kicked him out of the Beatles on John Paul and George's behalf. So um, that letter in 65 was sent by George Martin in support of the case against Pete Best. And it's not an anti-Pete Best letter. It's simply saying, this is my experience of Pete Best on that day. A very valuable thing to have on a piece of paper like that. As was the file note from Brian's solicitor, noting that in the phone call, Brian had explained to the solicitor, look, I did tell him why he was fired. I made it quite clear he was fired because he wasn't good enough. So, although Pete, for his own reasons, and quite understandable reasons, has always maintained he doesn't know why he was sacked, he did know, he just didn't want to hear it. And that's quite understandable. On the left there, my left. Yes. Yes, well, another good spot, thank you, Roy. Uh, Brian was referred to uh, by his secretary um, as Mr. Brian because in the um, NEMS shops, if you work, if you're an employee, and they did employ a lot of staff, the Brian and his brother Clive were known as Mr. Brian and Mr. Clive. They weren't called Sir. Mr. and Mrs. Epstein were Brian's parents, very respectful, but Brian was Mr. Brian and Clive was Mr. Clive. Yeah. 
that, that letter is just, I mean, Brian's dictated that letter, and while it's being typed, he's gone to meet George Martin. You can't get more immediate than that. You know, he's, he's signed in his absence because he's gone for the train to get the Beatles a recording contract. It's an absolutely beautiful moment, that, that letter. Sorry, another one. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's miscounting by one. I did work it out, I think it was eight. Ten or one of those, he's miscounted by one, I can't remember which way. But yeah, he knows. He knows yeah, how long he's been there. Yeah. Yeah, not long after, I would imagine. It's great that he says that. And that Paul says John is the leader of the group. I mean, just to volunteer these things is, shows how much it means to them at the moment. At the end of that first interview, I didn't play this bit. Uh, the interviewer Monte Vista says your new record out on Parlophone Records and the four of them in unison give its catalogue number, R4949. <laughs> they know their own catalogue number. Probably after that, that never happened again. Yeah. Yeah. Any more, or shall we call it a day? Yeah, okay. I'm going to go to the bar. I hope some of you, or all of you are, thank you.